Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. The sound of you doing is music to our ears. Order on the Home Depot app and get convenient delivery so you don't have to stop doing when you need something. The Home Depot app, how doers get more done. This week, we give you a few tips on how to correct any separation you may be having in your crown molding. It can be repaired fairly easy. Also, can you install a vinyl floor over a ceramic floor? Yes, of course you can, but you got to have the right preparation. Also, what needs to be considered when installing cabinets in your garage? And this time of the year, there's a lot of condensation problems. Can you solve those problems in your house? Yes, we'll give you a few tips on that. And what do you need to know to add insulation to your existing attic? And Joe, what about the simple solution? All right, Danny, this time of year, I think a lot of people are trying to keep their houses warm. So I thought I'd share a simple solution, how to detect drafts around windows and doors. You know, Joe, it is true with the the cold weather and certainly over the last couple of weeks, we even had temperature gets down to 25 degrees. Now, I see you chuckling, 25 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> <What>? <laughs> that is cold in the southeast, in Connecticut, eh, not so much, huh? Well, 25 is cold no matter where you are, right? I mean, it's if, if it's 25 in Alabama or Connecticut, it's still cold. The difference is 25 might be our high, and where for you, it, it'll probably be your low for the day. But yeah, it's still cold, and if you're not prepared for it, like people say, how did you ever work outside when I was doing construction? How did you ever work outside all winter? And, you know, you just bundle up and you <laughs> go out there, right? We all had mortgages to pay. You just make yourself go out there. And once you're out there, you know, and if the sun's shining, it makes a huge difference. It's the wind oh, yeah. that can make 25 degrees feel like 25 below. So that, that's the only thing. But we work straight through the winter. You know, your hands were the only thing that were almost impossible to keep warm. Right. You know, in the construction things that, you know, uh, geographically throughout the country, how people build homes are always a lot different. Naturally, someone building a home in Arizona is going to be a little bit different than someone building one in the Northeast. And, you know, a lot of that's to do with water lines. You know, when you have a crawl space, you know, you run your pecs or your copper there. And we always encourage people to wrap those pipes because when you have a 25 degree night, you're going to have a possibility of some frozen pipes and some damage and also it helps a little bit on energy efficiency when you wrap them but in the north and in the real cold areas of the country I guess you really try to minimize any exposure of those pipes to that extreme cold by I guess burying them in the ground and making sure that they are insulated when they are exposed. Yeah exactly in the southeast and other parts of warmer climates you know homes are often built up on piers and the pipes are basically exposed to the weather because they're under the house. But here we can never get away with that. So everything is buried below the frost line. And the frost line is simply the depth to which the soil freezes. So you have to go slightly below that. And depending on where you are, if you're in Maine, you know, it might be 50 or 60 inches deep here in Connecticut and Western Connecticut where I am. I think the frost line depth is 52 inches. You know, in the Carolinas, it might be 24 inches. So anyway, when it comes out of the well, the water's coming, in my case, coming out of a deep well, or if it's coming from a municipality, the town's providing it, the lines run below the frost line. So they're digging trenches and that brings it right into the house. So it's never exposed no matter how cold it gets, it's never exposed to freezing temperatures. And that's simply like our basement. It comes into the basement way below the floor, and it comes up, and once it's in the basement, it's protected, even though the basement itself is not heated. You know, we had a funny situation with a, a homeowner that I spoke with the other day. They were talking about how for their whole life they had a well out in, you know, the side yard. Right. And they had a little pump house built over it, which, you know, often is the case and is a good idea. But still, during the really, really cold weather, they would always go out and hook up an incandescent light bulb. And 100-watt light bulb in there right. provided enough heat that they didn't have a problem with it. He goes, 
where's all the incandescent bulbs? Everything's LED and it doesn't heat up on me. I got a problem here. So. <laughs> oh no, technology doesn't create any heat. That's right. That's right. So uh, it's, it's some funny little problems like that that happen. But I'll tell you something else. During this time of the year, I'm always aware of this. So many people are spending so much more time inside the house. And we talk a lot about indoor air quality and the importance of that all year long. But no time is it more important than right now to make sure that you're using those exhaust fans to get that hot, moist air out of your house. And also, you know, of course, you're, you're going to go weeks and weeks and weeks without being able to air the house out a little bit. But uh, all of those things are real key. Your furnace filter, you know, make sure you're changing it and really look at a, a higher quality filter and make sure that when you're changing that filter, clean out as much as you can in that area behind the filter that where dust and particles may have kind of snuck through the filter in some manner. Make sure you clean all of that up. That indoor air quality is a big deal when you're stuck inside the house a lot. Yeah, and when people are changing filters, really make sure you get the right size filter that fits snugly because you put in, I've seen too many cases where people slide in a filter and it's like, wow, that went in really easily. And you look and it's too thin and the air is just blowing past the filter. It's probably a half of it is actually going through the filter. So be really careful because you can go and you to look at these filters like, how am I ever going to find the right one? There are like 30 of them. You know, they all kind of look alike. So if you have to take your old one with you, got to be really fitting pretty tightly. I mean, you should be able to slide into place, but it should be fitting tightly enough that air is not passing around the filter. And probably wouldn't want to caulk it in place. You know, we, we, talk, <laughs> no. we talk about cracks. <laughs> if you got a crack, you need to seal it up less. Don't use any caulking on, on the filter there. No, let's not do that. Hey, let's go to the Today's Homeowner Hotline. Vicki is on the line right Right now from Louisville, Kentucky, a beautiful town. Vicki, tell us uh, what we can help you with around your home. I have a 1955 house and I have a mosaic floor in my bathroom, much like Chelsea's house. I would like to put vinyl flooring over it. Is that a possibility? Well, yes, it is. You can do that. It does require a little bit of floor prep. And floor prep is something that eh, can be a little intimidating to people, but it's very, very simple. If you, you know, watch a few of the videos and so forth, we have a number of videos at todayshomeowner.com. But also a great place to go is custombuildingproducts.com. Custom Building Products has a number of very do-it-yourself friendly floor levelers. A lot of it is available pre-mixed right out of the can. And then you're using a smooth trowel. You can even use a drywall trowel to do this. And you're basically just creating a nice smooth surface because even though a lot of the mosaic type of ceramic is pretty much flush with the top of the tile itself, you still want to make sure that that will not transfer up through any vinyl material that you put down. So essentially that's it. You're cleaning the floor. You're putting the floor level or floor patch compound over it. And uh, generally, a lot of this stuff dries really, really fast, but you want to make sure you read the instructions to see how soon you can apply your vinyl floor. Then you can move forward with your vinyl floor and you're done. Now, be aware you can never go back to that ceramic because once you put the floor patch compound on it, it's going to stay on that surface of that tile. You won't be able to pull it up and try it again later. Thank you very much. Joe, what do you think um, on that? I mean, you know, you and I might might even cringe just a little bit in thinking about covering up a, a high-quality ceramic floor right. with a, you know, a less expensive floor on vinyl. A lot of people, you know, want to change things, and that's one way of doing it without having to completely remove that. But in the in the great um, tile book that you wrote a few years ago, I assume that you probably explored the some options on this. Yeah, ordinarily, Danny, we get a call of putting tile on top of vinyl, not vinyl on top of tile. But <laughs> I know it. I know it. The product Danny was referring to is called a simple prep floor patch. And that's again from Custom Building Products. Right now we're going to head to Ohio. Ken is on the line. Ken, welcome to the show and tell us about your garage and some of your plans for that. Hey Danny, it's, uh, it's nice to talk to you. I've really had a problem with this garage, but I've completely redone my garage, took out all the old paneling and the drywall on the walls. I also had a new ceiling put in, a pull-down attic with stairs in it, and a complete new floor. So what I'm most wanting to know is I've been looking for the best wall cabinets to put up in my garage. It seems like the ones that I really like the most are kitchen cabinets. But my question is, can I install regular wood kitchen cabinets in there? Because I've got some people telling me it's okay and others say no. 
So I'm just wondering what you prefer. Well, as a general rule, is it fairly dry in there? Do you have a lot of uh, sweating on the floor or, you know, general kind of high humidity situations in the garage? Uh, No, not really. Good, good, good. Yeah, it's been fine. Well, you know, um, kitchen cabinets are designed to be in a heated and cooled space. When you don't have that, um, you know, sometimes people will say, no, you can't do that. And some of the lesser grade cabinets that would be, you know, a poor quality, you know, different types of wood that you're going to have in there. You, you got to be real, real careful with it, particularly on the base cabinets. I'll tell you what I would do, no matter what you put in there, I, I would use a clear polyurethane on the inside and the outside area that's not finished. Now, if these are not finished, you would want to stain or prime and paint the whole entire thing. But the type that have the particle board on them are the ones you have to be careful with for your base cabinets. Okay. Wall cabinets, not so much, but either way, you're going to want to put maybe um, maybe some one by four treated wood to get it up off the floor so that uh, that slab will not contribute to any moisture getting into the cabinetry. And then you should be in great shape on that. Naturally, you don't want to go buy the, the, the best cabinets in town to put in your garage, but you might want to just step up from the lowest grade to get some that will withstand um, what will be you know, more uh, harsh conditions than you would have inside your house. Okay, that's great. I appreciate all your help on that. So so I've just had so many people tell me different things. I'm not, I wasn't sure what to do. So, Oh, no, I understand. I understand. And that's the, that's the case on many, many opinions out there. You get plenty of opinions, that's for sure. And that's a, one of the things about the uh, Internet. You know, you, you go on there and sometimes it can confuse you more than anything else. Joe, what do you think about this? Sounds like a great project Ken's got going. Yeah, Ken, I see kitchen cabinets. People, when they redo their kitchen, sometimes the cabinets are perfectly fine. It's like, well, no sense just throwing them away. So they put him in the garage. Now, is this going to continue to be used as a garage? No. No. No, Joe, it's a garage. I just had it completely uh, done, and I'm going to leave it as a garage. I'm not putting any base cabinets in. I'm just putting wall cabinets in this. Oh, okay. Uh, the whole, all along the back side because it's like a, a smaller garage, a two-car garage. But it's not a two and a half, so I don't really want to mess with the depth of it to get my cars in. Is this attached or detached? It's attached. Okay, you know, that helps a little bit. It's not completely surrounded by the outdoors. I think you'd be fine. Like Danny said, just try to stay away from the particle board. I don't even like particle boards inside the house, so I certainly won't like them outside the house. (laughs) Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. I appreciate you guys' help. All right, Ken. Anytime, Ken, if we can help you. And and best of luck on the garage, because once you get that thing like you want it, you'll spend a lot of time out there. I appreciate it. Hopefully, Ken won't be forced to spend time out there. You know, <laughs> you want to go thinking. out in the garage. It's not you don't want to be summoned to the garage. And <laughs> exactly, um, actually, we're doing uh, we're right in the middle of uh, taping an episode for our television show um, where we're removing some cabinetry. A large, large, very impressive cabinet, but it's so big inside a living room. And so, you know, we asked the homeowners, naturally, you think this going in the garage, and um, we we received a a real swift no from the the lady of the house okay and then so the the guy i could tell he's a character because he says but honey i can put my all my lures in over here and my <laughs> antique rods and reels here and then my tackle box is here right and you know their eyes rolling back and forth so we're going to play that up a little bit when i get back on the shoot okay. you know and and talk about yeah we can put a little rack here for for all of your rods and reels and uh we're going to mess with them a little bit on that one today's homeowner is brought to you by the home depot how doers get more done. It's time for our best new product segment brought to you by the Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. You know, smart home devices are not new, but they haven't always been easy to integrate into your home. So Leviton is doing their part to simplify the whole process with the Decora Smart Wi-Fi Dimmer. Now, unlike many others, this smart dimmer requires no additional hub to be connected to your home's network. You simply replace a switch with the dimmer and then you can control it with your phone through the My Leviton app. Now you can dim it, you can create custom settings for preset light levels, fade rates, bulb types. You can even schedule the lights to turn on when you want and to create any type of lighting scene. Also works with Hey Google, Amazon Alexa, or Apple Home Kit and Siri to dim and brighten connected bulbs and fixtures via voice or through the app. And you can connect it with um, other Decora smart Wi-Fi devices to expand that control throughout your house. So if you're thinking of making a step towards 
a smarter home. Think about this. Replacing just one dimmer can get you started on that. And you can find out about this Leviton Decora Smart Wi-Fi dimmer by heading over to homedepot.com. Now it's time for our podcast question of the week from Kentucky. And Kyle asks, I'm about to install some crown molding for the very first time. Can you share any advice on the best tips and tools to use? Also, how do you cut the angles for inside and outside corners? This molding isn't cheap, so I don't want to make too many mistakes. That's exactly right. You start making mistakes with that, it adds up pretty quickly. That is a good, good question. And and I'll tell you what, in crown molding, it's it's a little tricky question to answer, even though there's a a lot of information on our website at todayshomeowner.com to be able to guide you through it. I mean, when you've done crown molding a good bit, Joe, it's really very simple, right. and it depends on the saw that you have at your disposal, whether or not it's a compound miter saw or traditional miter saw, because when you tell someone to take a piece of molding and cut it upside down and backwards, right. it's like, well, wait a minute. What? I do that all the time, and it never yeah. works out. Why is it working out now? <laughs> well, what would you say to Kyle? Because there's a lot of jigs out there through like Craig Company that has the different ways to kind of help you on some of the crown molding, but how, how do you, what, what would you recommend to Kyle? Because I know you've installed a lot of crown molding over the years. I have. And it is the kind of job that by the time you get good at it, the job's done. You know, it's like, well, (laughs) I'm not going to do that again. Now I know how to do it. So what you could do is help your neighbor put up crown molding and figure out how to do it correctly, then come to your house and do it. (laughs) But uh, yeah, you need a miter saw, you know, a power miter saw. I mean, it's really the only way to do it. And, And Danny's right. The easiest way is to place it upside down in the miter saw at an angle, at the angle that it will be installed on your ceiling. So That means flush against the vertical fence and flat down on the horizontal saw table. And you can typically hold it in place with your hand, you know, if it's not too wide. Otherwise, I've shown a simple solution where you hot melt glue a thin stick to the saw table just to hold it in place. But in any case, so that's how you do it. You cut it upside down um, and you just set the saw at a 45 degree angle. Now, for the corners, you want to miter cut the outside corners and cope cut the inside corners. And then you scarf joints when you're joining two lengths of molding together. Although, to tell you the truth, unless you have a really big room, you can get moldings like 16 feet long. So you really shouldn't even have to piece them together. But in any case, in a cope joint, you can go to the website and see some videos and use a coping saw, a little coping saw. And you first cut it at a 45 degree angle. And then you cut along the profile with the coping saw. So one piece nests against the other. That's about the easiest way to explain it. If you see it, a video of it, it's pretty self-explanatory. But that's really all you need to know. Now, the other trick is when you're nailing this up, Danny, nailing along the bottom isn't an issue, Mm -hmm. right? Because you nail it to the studs. What about nailing it to the ceiling? If the joints are going in the other direction, you have nothing to nail to. So depending, again, on the size of the molding, sometimes you get away with just nailing it along the bottom. And where it does run perpendicular to the ceiling joists, you can nail into the ceiling joists. Where it doesn't, don't worry about it. It usually has enough holding power. You can put some caulk up there if you need to, to hold it in place. And the other suggestion, if it's really wide molding, of taking a piece of plywood, three-quarter inch plywood, bevel, rip it at an angle, and fit it into the corner. And then you can just screw it into the corner. And then you can put your crown molding over it. And then you can nail or screw almost anywhere along there because you're nailing into this backer board which is the plywood well you did a great job in explaining that because it is very difficult it's a fairly simple process right but it's a little difficult to explain but i would certainly encourage you to go to today's homeowner.com and just put in our little internal search engine there installing crown mold and a lot of tips and a lot of ways and a lot of videos that can help you on that part of it and there's nothing like putting crown molding in and really any room in the house bathrooms you know kitchens anywhere that can certainly enhance the look of the a room considerably. And the other tip is paint it or stain it before you put it up. Oh, You'll yeah. save yourself oh, yeah. so much work. Prime it, paint it if you have to. You can usually buy it primed. And I would suggest wood molding, not the MDF. It's harder to nail the MDF. And when you use a pneumatic nailer, which I would also suggest, it creates a little sort of raised point of fiber for every place to put a nail in. You have to sand it down. So just get wood. And if you can get a cordless nailer, finish nailer, or pneumatic nailer, that makes it a lot easier because you can hold it up one hand and nail it with the other 
without trying to hold the nail and the hammer. Oh, yeah, definitely well worth it. And just take your time and enjoy the process. And uh, once you get it all finished and do a little touch-up painting, look over your shoulder and see what you were able to accomplish, nothing like it. Pick up the phone and give us a call. 800-946-4420 is the Today's Homeowner Hotline. Or if you like to send emails, we like to get them. You can send it by going to todayshomeowner.com slash ask right now we're going to see if we can help donna out in houston texas donna welcome to the show and tell us what's going on around your house hi i have crown molding in one room and y'all recently had an article about how to repair drywall but i have a crown molding that has cracked and i would like to know how to repair it okay all right is that um i assume the crack that you're seeing is at a seam where two pieces of crown come together actually it's not it's a diagonal crack about halfway down the wall. Huh. Now, now some sometimes um, some trim guys do the diagonal cuts like this, but this crack you're seeing is not perfectly straight. Then, like a like a trim cut, it's uh, maybe jagged, as if something is settling. Yes, correct. Okay. A little unusual because normally crown molding is fairly flexible and if there is any type of movement and so forth, it will kind of bend and kind of go along with any of that settling. But you're not seeing any cracks in any of the drywall uh, above or below the crown molding where you're having the problem? I am not, no. I do have a crack in in the drywall, but it's on on a separate wall. Joe, what do you think on this? Because if there was active settling, you know, Donna would certainly see something on the drywall wall or ceiling. You think maybe there could be a little defect in the crown molding itself originally? Yeah. So Donna, this crack is in the crown molding itself. It's not at a seam, but just the crown molding itself is cracked. Is that correct? That's correct. And are you sure this is wood molding made out of wood as opposed to polyurethane or MDF or something like that? Yes, I am sure. And it's a crack, but it's a kind of a, like Danny said, it's a little bit of a jagged crack. It's not perfectly straight, like from a saw cut. Well, it's not truly jagged, but it is diagonal. Okay. It kind of sounds like it might be one of those scarf joint cuts that they make, which is often a compound angle cut, meaning it's at an angle across the miter and as the bevel. And the reason they do that is so that when these two pieces come together, instead of just butting them together with square cuts, if the molding shrunk a little bit, you'd see that space. Here, if it shrinks a little bit, it would move a little bit, but it wouldn't open up a joint where you wouldn't see it. So what you might be seeing is that diagonal scarf joint. And so if that's what it is, like, okay, you know, assuming this isn't a split, maybe someone drove in a nail and cracked it or something like that. But if it is the scarf joint, okay, so what do you do about it? Well, there's really not much you can do. I guess you could try caulking it or filling it and painting over it. But then if the molding swells come summer, you know, then it's going to move back in and I'm not sure what it would look like. Without seeing this, it'd be really hard to tell. Is this the only place where you see this problem? Yes. Is it a long stretch of a relatively long wall? Yes. Okay, well, if it was a short reason I asked, because if it was a short wall, meaning less than eight feet or so, even less than 10 or 12 feet, it would probably be one piece of molding. But if it's a long wall, they often will put in two pieces. It shouldn't be any more than two pieces of molding. So maybe that's exactly what it is. It's that scarf. It's called a scarf joint. And and you know what happens on this is that expansion and contraction that happens so much to all just all kinds of things in the home. And uh, you'll be surprised. I've heard many, many people say, you know, I know there was a crack there and it's, it's the middle of summer and it's just as tight as can be and disappears. I know you want to address it now, but I'm using a very, very little acrylic caulk. Now, we're, we're saying all of this, assuming the molding is painted and not stained. Is that correct? That is correct. It is painted. Yes. Okay. If you use just a small amount of, of um, you know, an acrylic latex caulk, which is, you know, very, very available, and you just apply it with your finger and wipe it down really tight, the crack will go away. It remains a little flexible. When it does uh, expand during the summer, you know, it, it, it has that flexibility that should be able to disguise it. But if you want to be patient and wait a few months, you'll be surprised how that thing will completely disappear. <laughs> 
Okay, well, thank you both very much. Okay, our pleasure, Donna. We, you know, we used to get these calls all the time, Joe, uh, during this time of the year where that expansion and contraction is bound to happen, and that can happen on your floor, that can happen on door trim. Certainly, it seems to be more obvious a lot of times on crown molding that in some cases will make it look like the crown molding's you know almost falling off the wall because of cracks that you see under and above the crown molding itself, but um, that just shows you what, uh, and, and it's probably more prominent on outside walls because you have more of the influence of the weather on those outside walls. But uh, it's I wish we could tell her a little bit better than just be patient. It'll go away. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, and plus she's in Houston, which is get has really humid summers. And when the heat's on, I assume the heat's probably on or whatever. It's probably really dry now. So, you know, that, that would have some movement in the molding itself. Let's go to the Today's Homeowner Hotline right now and see if we can't take care of a few of these calls. My name is Diana, and I live in southeast Missouri. And the reason for my call today is my husband and I just purchased a brand new build. It's about 1,400 square feet with a full basement, and we've lived here approximately 60 days. And what I've noticed since the weather has changed is that all of my windows in this home are condensating. And they're condensating so much, in fact, that the window sills are completely soaked and running out of the sill down the wall. So my question is, first of all, what's wrong? And secondly, um, is there a solution to correct this problem? I contacted the builder and he said, oh, run a dehumidifier. But I'm thinking with a brand new build, why do I have so much condensation? We do have ceiling fans. We also have two bathrooms, one of which has a window in. And so before any kind of bathing and such, I run the exhaust fans. And then I run them several hours after, like shower or bathing. Um, It's in every window in this home, including the sliding glass door. And again, this is Diana. And my question today is about serious condensation on a brand new build home on my window. So thanks. Well, Diana, thanks for that call, and uh, I'm sure other people are experiencing some of the same things. And I, I really, uh, I hate that for you with it uh, certainly being a brand new home like that. You don't expect a severe condensation like that. And Joe, I don't know what you think. I certainly think the builder should be responsible for this, and at least making an effort, because what what is happening is one or two things. One, you have too much humidity in your home. And if you have too much humidity in a home, summer or winter, that means the air conditioned heating system is not working properly. It's not exchanging the air, which will allow the humidity to go down. The other situation could be you have the windows are not adequately sealed around the perimeter of the windows or the quality of the windows is allowing the cold air during this time of the year to seep in in certain areas. It meets the warmer air inside your home causing that condensation, which sounds like a pretty severe case. But Joe, so often times, you know, when we when we talk about this situation, it does go back to the heating and cooling system is just not sized properly, and they could have easily thrown those windows in there and, you know, didn't caulk properly, didn't flash it properly, and that could be the problem. What do you think? Yeah, and the fact that it's on every window, every sliding glass door shows it's a whole house problem, probably not specific to one or two windows that were improperly installed. And it's definitely humidity, high humidity inside. So what's causing all the high humidity? Well, a brand new build, some of these materials might not be as dry as they should have been. They're releasing moisture. The other thing is it might be a super insulated house where someone went and sprayed foam everywhere and it's so locked in, there's no ventilation, which would be an issue. But yeah, I mean, the builder, if this is a brand new build, I'm not sure if it's in a neighborhood, in which case is every house experiencing that? I mean, if I was Diana, I'd certainly go to my neighbor and check if it's just this one house in a neighborhood of older homes and that wouldn't help her much but it's definitely too much humidity and they've got to find a way to vent it out right now and putting in a dehumidifier is a band-aid solution that's not solving the problem it's capturing that humidity but you have to stop the source of the humidity exactly otherwise what's going to happen come a really humid time of the year so you're going to have mold growing on these windows yeah i think that's a good idea to check in with neighbors and see if they're having any problem but either way if the builder is not taking you serious well it's time to write a letter not necessarily a threatening letter but just one saying i'm not happy this is the conditions i'm um, experiencing concerned about the deterioration of my because this will deteriorate your walls it'll deteriorate it'll it'll encourage in 
insect infiltration. It's, it's, it's all bad. And I would just ask the builder to remedy the situation within 10 days and uh, see what type of integrity of the builder is. I mean, it's, uh, that's as simple as it is. New house is not suitable conditions. You need to take care of it within 10 days. That's what I would recommend because it can be minimized. It can be remedied. And I hate that you're having to go through that, Diana. But hopefully uh, that's our opinion. So time to write a letter. Let's go to another call. was wondering about mold-in insulation in the attic of my old house. wonder if there was a big difference in the kind of insulation to use. I appreciate it. I enjoy listening to you on the radio. appreciate it very much. Hey, well, thanks a lot for listening to us. And we certainly uh, deal with a lot of insulation questions. There's a there's all kinds of different types of insulation, but I've always been a fan of going to um, staying with the same type of insulation that you have currently. So if you're looking up in there and you see a sprayed um, or, or a blown um, pink insulation, then I would go with the blown insulation. Now, of course, it could be a white insulation too, but still, um, if that's what you have, I would go back with additional. And we always tell people to keep it simple, and you need at least 14 inches of insulation, 14 inch uh, deep blanket of insulation once everything is uh, completed. And if you have cellulose insulation, go back with cellulose. And Joe, um, it's a very easy project, not fun necessarily, no. but um, to add, um, if you have bat insulation, then to add unfaced bats running perpendicular over your joist, uh, man, that can make a mountain of difference in a house. Yeah, I assume he must have blown in insulation now. We're assuming he has some insulation. I can't imagine it has none. But uh, so he's probably is why he's asking about blown in. And if it's small enough, you could attic, you could do it yourself. Otherwise, call in a contractor within a couple hours. They can blow the whole thing in. And the, the two main types are cellulose and fiberglass. And the difference is fiberglass is more readily available. It's less expensive, but it doesn't have as high R value. I think cellulose has a R value of about three and a half to three point, I think it was eight per inch. And fiberglass is our value of about 2.2 to almost 3 per inch. That's a slight difference. And they do make, I know that Owens Corning makes one called Therma Fiber, and it's blown in mineral wool. And that's, that's more expensive, but that has really high R value. So those are probably your three choices. Hey, coming up, simple solution for my buddy Joe Truini. It's a good one that might save you a few of those energy dollars when we come back. From installing a smart garage door opener to installing a bathroom faucet, to removing a tree. The Home Depot believes you can do anything, especially the things we have how-to guides for. Visit homedepot.com for thousands of tips, workshops, and ideas for projects, big and small. The Home Depot app, how doers get more done. Is your backyard more blah than ah? If so, then you need to enter the Backyard Paradise Contest, brought to you by our friends at Pavestone and Quickrete. One lucky contestant will win their own luxurious landscape. The Pavestone and Quickrete pros will design a project just for the winner's home, worth up to $10,000, and help Danny and his team install it. Plus, the whole process will be featured on an episode of Today's Homeowner TV. So get your yard ready for warmer weather. Enter now. Just go to todayshomeowner.com slash backyardparadise. Danny Lipford here, along with my buddy Joe Truini, and Joe's going to share with us another simple solution. What do you have for us, Joe? All right, Danny, I think a lot of people are concerned this time of year of keeping their house warm, so here's an easy way to determine if cold air is blowing in around an exterior door. First thing you have to do is close and lock the door. It's really important to lock the door, because sometimes that will pull the door closed um, a little tighter. And then take a lighted candle and hold it very close to the joint between the door and the door jamb, and just slowly move the candle around all four edges of the door. And of course, what happens if there's any draft blowing in, it'll make the flame dance, as they say, right? The flame will, if it blows it out completely, then you really have an issue. <laughs> but usually it just, uh, it just makes the flame dance a little bit, indicating exactly where you have to fix or replace the weather stripping. And you might find it's only one or two spots. Some people think, oh, well, if wind is blowing in, it's blowing in around the whole door. But that's not almost never the case, unless someone took out the weather stripping and didn't replace it. So you can find exactly where that spot is. Um, and this also works around windows, but the only cautionary bit I want to tell you is, of course, it's an open flame, so be careful around drapes or curtains or blinds or anything like that. And if you're concerned at all, then you can also use a uh, smoldering stick of incense. Get a, get a, piece of in, a stick of incense, uh, the biggest one you can get, and light it 
blow out the flame, then of course it will smolder and put up some smoke, and the same thing will happen. But that's really a quick way to find out exactly where that wind is blowing in. And you're right. A lot of times it can be just a little adjustment. It might be um, in the actual strike plate that you can tighten it up. Uh, it also can be where maybe on some of the um, the um, foam weather stripping has gotten more compressed. A lot of times you can take a pair of pliers and actually pull that out, kind of nurse it out a little bit, as we say, so that you get the compression that you need. And, you know, we talk all about the importance of sealing up the envelope of your home. And this is a great example and a very simple one that you can do to keep that cold air from infiltrating and costing you a lot on your energy bill. Yeah. And the other tip I want to mention, if you do have to ever replace weather stripping, whether it's a door or a window, even even a garage door or whatever, when you pull out the old weather stripping, bring it to the store with you. Because mm-hmm. if you show up without it and you think you're going to remember what it looks like and you get in that aisle, it's like, oh, well, I have, there's like 30 different types and come, they're all packaged. I mean, it really can be pretty confusing. So take a piece of the old weather stripping with you. Um, hopefully you get a section that's not too badly damaged. And, um, and bring it to the store with you. This way you can get the right size. Yeah, exactly. And that, and that, that can make such a difference on your, your windows, your doors, everywhere. And, you know, as soon as you can get a, a decent day that the temperature is up, let's say, above 45, then uh, walk around real carefully on the outside of your house. You might find some cracks that you didn't even realize around that area where your evaporative lines come out for your air conditioning, maybe around a hose bib here and there. Things do happen, and you're able to seal those off and make it a lot more energy efficient and you might find the source of some of those cold drafts that you have around your house yeah and we were just talking to ken who has an attached garage if you have an attached garage you've got to insulate that door you know especially the weather stripping along the bottom and anything you do now you just built a new house and even though you're in the southeast do you did you insulate the garage door at all uh, no, no, I didn't. But, but I, it's it, it's insulated. It is insulated. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I bought one. Yeah, that 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 already has the foam in it, so it's in it's in pretty good shape. Oh, good. Yeah, because hot or cold climate, you really should insulate that door. It's the biggest door in the house, right? You might as well insulate it. That's right, and and it will influence the inside of your home if you're not careful. Hey, thanks so much for being with us on this today's homeowner podcast. I'm Danny Lifford, along with my buddy Joe Truini. We'll talk with you soon.